we're going to look at how nutrients get in and out of the brain, mostly in. The first thing that we're going to worry about is oxygen. Brain needs a lot of oxygen. Nervous system needs a lot of oxygen. Retina sure needs a lot of oxygen. Spinal cord needs oxygen. Brain needs oxygen. So we have to get oxygen to the brain. And the first thing I want to convince you of is that the brain is particularly sensitive to not having oxygen. If you're at the top of Mount uh, Everest, do you worry about your heart or your brain not having oxygen? The answer is you worry about your brain not having oxygen. Your heart can deal with being uh, hypoxic, having little oxygen or no oxygen for a lot longer than your brain can. So let's talk about being up on, on Mount Everest. In Mount Everest, there's the same proportion of oxygen in the atmosphere. It's still 20% roughly, uh, but it's, it's, under, it's at a much lower pressure. So in one breath, whereas you used to take in three oxygen molecules, now you're going to take in one. And so you're going to have not enough oxygen to support nervous system function, not enough to support brain function. Now, if any of you have ever gone to a high altitude all of a sudden, what some of you may experience, I, I get this experience, um, other, it depends on where you grew up, it depends on a lot of very, various um, susceptibilities, but if you're susceptible to altitude sickness, what you're, the problem with altitude sickness is not enough oxygen in every breath. So it's a, it's a situation of hypoxia. Another situation where you have less oxygen than normal is getting onto a, a airplane, a commercial airplane, where it's around 15% instead of 20%. But up at, at Mount Everest, it's, it's too low, uh, e even for, um, uh, for, for a person to, to, to exist for too long. So the, the symptoms of altitude sickness are those symptoms that occur when the nervous system does not get enough oxygen. And this is confusion and lightheadedness and, and actually an impairment of consciousness. So we absolutely need con we absolutely need oxygen. How do we get the oxygen? We get the oxygen from blood. So the, the oxygen comes in, um, uh, we get it from blood and the amount of blood that we get is dependent on the perfusion pressure which is arterial pressure minus venous pressure in the rest of the body. But in the brain, it's, it's perfusion pressure is uh, equal to arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. Why is there a difference? Because intracranial pressure is about 15 millimeters rather than the five millimeters of venous pressure. So we now have a, a, a narrower zone of uh, possible perfusion pressure with which to, to, in which to operate in the brain than in the rest of the body where there's not this bony uh, cranium. So oxygen depends on perfusion, uh, on cerebral blood flow, which depends on perfusion pressure. So we have to worry about, um, about cerebral perfusion pressure. So as I just said, cerebral perfusion pressure is uh, normally mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. Intracranial pressure should be fixed at about 15 millimeters of mercury. Two things can go wrong to decrease the value of this difference. The value of this difference is the cer cerebral perfusion pressure. It can be de the cerebral perfusion pre per pressure can be decreased below the necessary value by either a drop in, in mean arterial pressure, hypotension, or an increase in intracranial pressure. So an increase in intracranial pressure happens because of trauma, because of inflammation, because of a stroke, because of a hemorrhage, uh, et cetera, because of a tumor. All of these things will increase intracranial pressure. And we have to worry a lot about intracranial pressure. That's what a lot of this, um, this, this chapter will be about. We worry so much about cerebral perfusion pressure that we, we have a, a, a very dedicated uh, pair of systems that allows us to maintain uh, cerebral blood flow, cerebral perfusion pressure within a uh, steady between a lot of different values of arterial pressure. And this is called autoregulation. And autoregulation in the brain 
allows you to operate with the needed amount of cerebral blood flow between about 60 and 150 millimeters of mercury um, of, of mean arterial pressure. If you b go below that, cerebral blood flow will go down. What will happen if you don't have enough cerebral blood flow? You will faint. Faint means lose consciousness, lose postural tone. Down you go. So that, uh, another word for faint is syncope. That's the spelling, S-Y-N-C-O-P-E, syncope. So we want to avoid syncope. On the other end, if blood pressure is too high and cerebral blood flow gets to, uh, cerebral perfusion pressure is too elevated, well, the perfusion pressure will push through the blood vessels and they will actually burst. It's too much pressure on the blood vessels. So that's not good either. So what we want to do is keep uh, cerebral uh, perfusion pressure in this regulated zone. Now, there are situations when your mean arterial pressure will, will increase and that you want it to increase. One example is you're moving a lot, you're running away, you're exercising. Uh, in the old days, we were running away from predators, now we're, we're going to the gym and exercising. Uh, in in it, any case, during that period, the the uh, range of tolerable arterial pressures has shifted to the right. And now the only danger is that you can get syncope at pretty high pressures where you wouldn't normally get syncope because you've shifted your, your range, your acceptable range uh, to the right. And I just want to say a, a word about the uh, mechanisms of autoregulation. There are two main mechanisms. One is myogenic. If, the, uh, if there's um, a low blood flow to an area, the blood vessels dilate to then increase the amount of blood going to that area. And the other one is metabolic. If there is a lot of CO2 production and a low uh, oxygen uh, levels, then that suggests that that part of the brain is very busy. And again, the vessels will dilate to deliver more blood and therefore more oxygen to that part of the brain. And this is the principle upon which uh, uh, blood oxygen levels are, are assessed but through magnetic resonancing, resonance imaging, for example. Okay, so that, that is, we, that is uh, the long and short of our need for oxygen. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go one step back We've got autoregulation. Now we have to look at where are those blood vessels that are bringing that blood in to begin with. So we're going to look at the, the circulation of the brain, the circulation within the brain.